because I'm preaching today and I'm preaching tomorrow, and we're talking about I am victory and you're made for more, I've split today and tomorrow into two parts. Today, I want to talk about the mindset of victory. Tomorrow, I will talk to you about playing to win. Because a lot of people play, but they don't know how to play to win. And except you understand where you want to go and how to get there, and the things that are important to do, there are rules to the game. God is a God of order. And the world has its own order. And except you have an understanding of how to engage the world that you have been assigned to, in order to be victorious as your father has ordained that you will be, then we will spend too much energy and the fruits or the harvest will be too little compared to the effort. And that's not the promise of God. So today I want to talk about the mindset because a lot of people don't realize the way you think and the way you Look at everything makes all the difference to your ability to respond to every situation. The world will throw you many curves, many curve balls. It will throw you many troubles. There will be many situations that will come your way, but so what? The Bible already says in the world, you will see troubles. So the troubles of the world are not a problem. Because the Bible prepared us. God, you know the thing about God is he's a truthful God. He never lied to us. He said in the world you will see trouble. Then you have scriptures like how many times will a righteous man fall and yet he will rise again. Why is he talking about that except he knows that there are moments when you will fall. But what does the falling mean? We were having a conversation upstairs. In the eyes of ordinary men. When they think you are falling, they call you a failure. But they're, they're of all men foolish. As I explained upstairs, when you're at a point where men say you have failed today, five years, ten years down the line, the reason for today comes into play. And then you realize that today that men told you you failed, was not a failure after all. That it was a key, a component of the victory of the future. But God knew you had to pick it up five years before or ten years before and there was no other route that you could have followed except there. And the lessons of that point prepare you for the victory of tomorrow. Your mindset how do you think? How do you see? Who do you think you are? What do you think you have been called to? What do you think you are empowered with? The Bible says, they that know their God. They that know their God. What is he talking about there? They are the ones that will be strong and will do exploit. What does the knowing mean? Because what you know of your God affects how you look at situations. Yoruba people say, Omwe kunle kunjo. Now the child of a lion is like the lion. Think, why do you think America is very comfortable to go to war at any point in time? And the average American you talk to is arrogant about their expectation of victory of war. Why? Even they're crazy, let me not say. You understand? We'll tell you, I can wipe them off. Why? Confidence in what he knows that they have. They that 
know their God. Knowledge affects your mindset. Knowledge affects your attitude. Knowledge affects your level of confidence. Knowledge affects how you approach a situation. If the president sends you to a minister to get a contract, the way you will walk into the minister's waiting room, knowing fully well who has sent you is different. From when it's his brother that is from somewhere or somebody that is trying to introduce you, you're still a little fearful but somewhat expectant. But when the president of the federation who appointed the minister gives you a letter or calls the minister and says, I'm sending you my niece. She needs this. And he's saying, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. When you go there, you go with a sense of assurance and expectation to receive. Why? Because your mind is set on the fact that the one who has sent you has the right power and authority over the one who needs to give you what you want that you're almost certain, without a doubt, that what you have come to collect from there is a certainty. They that know they are God. What do you know about your God? How much of your God do you know? How well do you know your God? Because if you don't know the arsenal that you have, you cannot use it well. A man with a million dollars in his wardrobe who has no knowledge that is there will starve. And after he has starved and he has almost died, somebody might accidentally find the money and say to him, but you have money. You say, where? In your wardrobe. Oh, and I've suffered so much. How many of you have suffered so much for nothing? But yet, you have Christian after your name. You have child of Christ after your name. How do you think of yourself as a child of God? What does it mean to you in order for you to even begin to understand who he is? They that know their God. When you know who your God is and you understand his power, and you have spent time with him enough to have the assurance of his presence. You will approach every situation differently. You see that fear Pastor Bola talked about? It is so real to so many people. It's almost like a human being that lives next door. For some, it's like the guy who sleeps on the bed with them. And because of that fear, they undermine their own opportunities and their own talents. Because what you cannot see, you cannot be. What you cannot see, you cannot be. What you have no faith in, you can't take value from. They that know they are God. How much investment have you made in seeking to know your God? I've fought many battles in my life. <laughs> you know, I went to my friend's father's eighth day Muslim funeral prayer before I came here. And as they were reciting the Quran, I almost started reciting with them because I know it. I was born and bred a Muslim. I was brought up 
as a Muslim girl, I can recite some parts of the Quran for you right now. I can make the call to prayer. And those things never go away. It was right there. So I had to be reschooled. And the word of the Bible, as opposed to my Islamic upbringing, I had to come to a place of knowing that Jehovah is God. And it's not a suggestion. It is not an expressed opinion. It is a fact of life. It is the truth that I know. And that truth has set me free from every fear or intimidation of every situation. And therefore my entire mind is set with an understanding that nothing is impossible to me. Why? Because the Bible says with God We say it, but do we believe it? Do we know it? Because if you think nothing is impossible to you, what will you do? If you knew that everything is available for every dream that you have, what will you try? If you know that what will take you to any distance that you want to go is available to you. How far will you travel? They that know their God. Do you know your God? Because the way your mind is set, your belief system, your understanding of who you are, when a child has a powerful father, when he goes on the street and a policeman tries to harass him, what's the first thing he's trying to do? Find his phone. Why? Because he knows all he needs to do is what? Make a call. They that know their God. But you have a powerful father. You have an all-powerful father. You have the creator of the earth and the universe. You have the creator of something out of nothing. You have the God that makes all impossibilities possible. You have the God that has given you an assurance of victory. We're going to use one story to highlight Open to Numbers 13. They that know their God. I want you to go home with that question. I want you to ask yourself over and over and over again. How much do I know my God? How much of my God do I know? How confident I am of the power of the God that I call mine. What, how much is the level of clarity that I have about who he truly is? And what does that mean to me in how I live my life on a day-to-day -day basis? When I face a situation, what is the first line of my thinking? Many years ago, 2004, January 7, I'll never forget. I was in business school then, but I was home. And I was studying. And I got a call from Tai Adirio, and God bless his soul. It was after 9 o'clock, network news was on. And he called to say, did you listen to the news? I said, no, but I'm busy, I'm studying. And he said, they just banned every form of furniture from coming into Nigeria. I said, eh, 
He said, I'm telling you, they just shut down your business and you are saying, yeah. I said, it's okay, it is well. He said, how can it be well? I said, don't worry, brother, it is well. The it is well came out of my spirit. It didn't come out of my flesh. Because it definitely wasn't well. As at that point, I had spent 15 years building this business. And if all of a sudden, government just makes an announcement that literally shuts down 15 years of my life, and I started the business at 25 going on 26, that's my youth. Dropped the phone, told my husband, we went to watch the recap of the news, listen to the news. I said, and then people started calling me, and I was the one assuring everybody, don't worry, it is fine. How is if I said, don't worry, it is fine? What was my assurance? The God that I knew. Why? Three years before, the Lord asked me, what if government does what they did? Three years. And I thought, ah, okay. So I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. I did all the preliminary work. I had all the reports, but I didn't execute. So when that happened, I knew that there was good in it for me. I didn't quite understand it, but I knew there was good in it for me. Why? What gave me my assurance? I sat down and I said to myself that without a doubt, I am certain that I am where the Lord has established my feet. And I was walking in the will of God. So check your walk because it affects your mindset. If you're walking outside of the will of God, when situations come, fear and condemnation will take hold of you. You're going to think about the things you're doing that are outside of God. And you're going to start self-accusation because you're going to be saying, ah, is it because of this? Is it because of that? Is it because... You will not be able to focus. Our conversation over the next two days might be a little hard. But, this is family talk. And we talk truth so that we can have our victory. And I said, God, I know you. You are not a wicked God. And the Bible says to me that your thoughts towards me, they are thoughts of good and not of evil. To bring me to an expected end. The Bible says you delight in my prosperity. You are not a wicked God. Therefore, I am sure that you will not establish my feet upon the rock and kick the rock from under my feet. That's not you. They that know they are God. Because in the time of crisis is when you need victory. You cannot have victory except you are at war. So the war is not the problem. The challenges are your bread. They're consumables. Why are they bread? Because there's nothing sweeter than victory. And you cannot have victory without battle. So we cannot be battle afraid, but we must be battle ready. And for you to have victory, you must be empowered and equipped for the moments you have not even seen. But that you know that the one that looks after you has seen it ahead of time. So I said, you will not kick the rock from under my feet. So I'm certain that whatever this is, which I do not necessarily understand, but I know you, and I know that you have said all things work together for my good. Therefore, there must be good in this situation for me. Now, the difference between 
narrowing down to the point where I decide that there's good in it for me, or the alternative, where I panic and see what I consider as destruction of 15 years of work, of multiple businesses built, of hundreds of people employed, of value created in the economy, can give me a heart attack if I had no understanding. Or can push me away from facing the roar of the lion to running in the direction of where the female lion is waiting. And what did that mean in that situation? It was an option between becoming a smuggler because the laws changed. And if I decided that I had to continue in that business because I know that God called me to it, even though I know that God called me to it, I could misinterpret his purpose for this situation. I could then decide, well, God, I don't know how else to do this. But I can smuggle the furniture, and what will I become? A smuggler. Does that glorify God? Where is the honor? I definitely won't be standing here today. The integrity label will not have stuck. Because before then, that was my name. In the middle of that crisis, I had to prove my name. Who you say you are is easy. When a season of prosperity and joy and celebration. But the substance of who you are is tested. Only when you are at war and in the season of challenges. And victory does not exist outside of troubles. So I took my position with God and said, that good that is in this that I can't clearly see now, I know that you will show me the way. And then I said to all my staff, nobody's going anywhere. Just stay calm. I'm not firing anybody. We're not doing anything. Lord, guide me. Open my eyes to see and lead me every step of the way, day by day. January this year, that same chair center group became 30 years old. Out of that crisis, we set up two additional companies. Before then, there was no office seating European Standard Factory in Sub-Saharan Africa. My French partners, who we ended up investing together and setting up here, were, were producing for us, but I've never invested anywhere outside of Europe. Nigeria was definitely not going to be their first choice. It looks impossible. But after I had reached a point that there was good in it for me, I had the courage to ask for the impossible things. And I went to the largest office city manufacturer in in England, in France, and one of the top 10 in the world, sat across from a large team and said to them, come to Nigeria with me and let's set up manufacturing together. They laughed, but little did they know that though I was sitting on one side alone, I had the whole of heaven on my side. And I had the confidence of the word of God and the God that I serve. And I said to them, you either come with me and we do this, or I will do it without you, because I will do it anyway. Yeah. How? Psh. The how is not my problem. It's his problem. But I had the audacity to trust that he would deliver. Yeah. Your mindset. How do you think? What do you believe? What do you see when you have a situation that requires victory? When you are challenged, how do you position yourself against that challenge? How do you process all the information that is coming at you? What lens are you looking at? 
Do you see the cup as half empty or half full? Because they're totally opposite views. When you look at a cup that has half level of water and you see it as half empty, you're not an optimistic, ambitious, forward-looking visionaire. When you see it as half full, you can see the future, but you accept the interim. You know it is only half, but you know it will be full. The way your mind works is what determines how you, de how you describe the same thing. And your mindset is influenced, what word do you listen to? Thank God you're in a house that speaks the truth of the word. But in doing that, they teach you how to apply it to life. But beyond church, how do you invest in your mind? In reading the word and in educating and empowering yourself. We will read Numbers 13. It's the story of the children of Israel and the command from God for them to go and explore Canaan. Now, listen. Verse 1 to 3 is critical. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan. But he didn't stop there. He said, which I am giving to the Israelites. He gave an action instruction. Send some men to explore. But he added his end goal to it. They are going to explore this land that they have no title to. But the Lord says, go and explore it because I'm giving it to you. What does that mean? I have given you. I am giving you. The reason it's still I am is because you haven't possessed it yet. But he's sending you to view it and see whether the cup is half full or is half empty to you. Now, the word of God is settled. But with every promise, there's a demand for action. And the one who needs to act is you. Now, God didn't say that you will eat without work. I know. Quote me. I will eat vineyards that I didn't plant. It's not when you are sitting doing nothing from morning till night that somebody just comes to give you vineyard. Go and understand the scriptures well. Because we quote the scriptures without understanding. When you want to quote a scripture, read the history of it. Understand how it came about. And understand the spirit of the message. That's how you will know the heart of God. And what he's saying. He sent them to explore. For God, the matter was settled. But they had to own the promise. And to own the promise, they had to do the work. So God, my name is Belkisu. I was born and named Belkisu. At a stage of my life, the Lord changed my name in my 20s as I became a Christian. To Ibukun Oloa. As a matter of fact, the promise came in English. It said blessing. So if you go to Fountain of Life Church, they will tend to call me Pastor Blessing. But blessing means Ibukun, and I don't like English names at all. <laughs> so I was very quick to say, okay, if the Lord wants to call me Blessing, what is the meaning of blessing, Ibukun? End of story. That's how my name is Ibukun Awashika. So I'm leaving the promise of God on my life. And I believed Him enough. To make it what you have to confess every time you call me. But even though the Lord had called me a blessing. And had declared exactly how it would work out. I had to walk it. 
I have to make choices every day that aligns with the purpose and the declared will of God upon my life. I have to make choices every day that sets me in that direction. Why? Because God already made me with a will. I am made like him. I have enough power to stand against God. For him to say, go this way, and I say, no, I will not. And God will not force me to. But wisdom and understanding and the knowing of my God and submission of my will willingly to his will and his word takes me in the direction of God's declared victory for me on a day by day basis. So I understand I am victory. I understand the declared word but the reality is, every word of God in the Bible is for every child of God. But I haven't seen every child of God manifested. Is God partial? No. Is he wicked? No. He has done his part. His part is to lay before you the roadmap of your life as he sees it. That roadmap is in his word. In every single promise of God that is meant for you. How do you own it? It's in your mindset and your views. What do you see? How do you see? Do you see enough to fight for it? Or do you allow the roar to distract you from the goal? You will see. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each a central tribe, send one of his leaders. So at the Lord's command. Now, it's not every time you will hear a prophecy or you will hear a command. Every instruction in the Bible is a command. Every word of God that ministers to your spirit, every instruction of how to live your life, every instruction of righteousness is an instruction, is a command to you. If it's the word of God, how do you find yourself in the midst of all of those commands and promises in order to fulfill your own mandate? Anyway, then they listed all the names. That's not relevant. You can read it. Now, where I want to go to is go to verse 26. I wanted you to take the beginning because it's important to understand the command. This is, they have gone and they have come back. This is where we see their view, what they see and how they see. And how 20 children do not play together for 20 years. What separates them? And makes children of God in the same house listening to the, the same word with one same textbook. Every single one of us, we have the same textbook. It's the Bible. It's not different. My own is not different from yours. Your pastor's own is not different from yours. But it's what you take out of it. Your mindset and your view. That's what separates you from the crowd. The wheat and the chaff. That's how separation starts. That's how everybody is out of school and they're smart. You come out of secondary school, you all go into university. You finish university, first class, two, one, great. But somewhere along the line, attitude, approach, dedication, diligence, understanding, the word of God, the word of faith, determination, ability to fight, ability to stay focused, pursuing the things of God, pursuing righteousness, character, all of it begins to separate people. God meant for this to be true in the life of every one of his children. It's about how you see it, how you understand it, and how you apply it. Do you want to, be, to have victory? 
your mind has to be cleaned up and reset. Verse 26, Numbers 13. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negrev, the Etites, Jebusites, blah, 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 blah. Then Caleb, verse 30, separation. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. They saw the same thing. They went with the same instruction. They have exactly the same God. The God of the Israelites is the God of the universe. Same power backing them up. Instructed the same Moses. And Moses passed instruction to all 12 of them at the same time. But the 10 that gave the first account identified the prosperity and the richness of the land and why God would have wanted to give it to them. But they then finished it with their fear. Oh, the people are giants. Oh, the people are big. Oh, this the city is fortified. I bet Caleb was boiling as they were reporting. Why? Because though they looked at the same thing, he saw with a different set of eyes. And he could reach a different conclusion. And his conclusion, different from theirs, says, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. What gave him such confidence? What did he know that they did not know? Let's continue. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. Fear. They are stronger than we are. Foolishness. A people with the God of the universe on their side. This is after the Red Sea. A people who saw the greatest army on the face of the earth, the Egyptians, buried in the Red Sea on their behalf. Looked at mere men on land that was allowed for them by God at that moment. And had the audacity to come back and say, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. They didn't see people being devoured, but they concluded. You're laughing. The view of the world that you have will age the conclusions you make from the same circumstance. Where someone sees opportunity, some people only see trouble. When people see a chance to be lifted up, some look at the same opportunity and they can only think of the destruction. When they look in a valley and they see gold and someone says, I'm going to jump in and get it. Someone can only think about jumping in and dying. Same place. What do you see? How do you think? Who do you think you are? How do you see your God? How do you understand the power that is available to you? Victory is settled for you. It is not something you're about to go and get. It is something that is settled in Christ. However, 
you will walk your own path as that victory is defined for you. And that path is affected by how you see, how you think, and how much of your God you understand. The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim, whatever. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. How did they know? Were they in the eyes of the people? To know that they look like grasshoppers to the people. You're laughing. Do you know how many times people around you look at you and see the grace and the power of God in your life, but you look at yourself and all you see is a grasshopper. Do you know how many times people look at you and say, oh my God, if you just know, I just know that if you get into this place, you blossom. I say, me never. Hey, me care. You me call no one bit. Sorry, those that don't speak Yoruba. That, ah, it's not someone like me they're looking for there. Ah, I can never do it. You are never going to do it. Why? Even though everybody else knows you can. They can see you at work. Look, fear is legitimate. So fear is not the issue. There will always be things that will challenge you and make you almost doubt. But what you doubt is your personal limitation and ability. What you must never doubt is the awesomeness of the God that is yours and his power that is available to you. And if what you want to do is easy and simple, you have no business doing it. Why? It's of little value to you. Because it doesn't challenge you in any way. Therefore, it's bringing you no promotion. What elevates you? Things that are bigger than you. And what makes them possible? The God that is bigger than that situation. Let me tell you something today, and you must never forget this. Everything that you need for everything you were born to do is in you. Every talent, every ability, every skill, every capacity, every courage, every grace, it's already in you. But you don't need all of it at the same time. And therefore, at every stage of your life, when you walk into the situation where it is required, if you have the courage to step up and say, I can do this in Christ, grace is released. The talent manifests. It is why even you, you're surprised at what you're able to do. Wait till you see a mother who you thought could not walk at two kilometers an hour and sees a train about to run over his child or her child. And you will see that she can run at 50 kilometers an hour. Why? She didn't need 50 kilometers an hour before then. At the sight of the danger, the manifestation of the power and the ability is released. And she delivers on it. After she's wondering, me, did I just do that? Yes, you did. Everything you need, God already placed in you. But for a time and a season. But it's when you step up to the season. Do you think I sat down at any point and decided, oh, I want to become chairman of First Bank. <laughs> ah, you know what Nigeria is? That's what it is. The dynamics. Of assignments. But you know what? They that know their God. They shall be strong. And they will do exploits. It is the knowing of God that gives you the confidence. When everybody else says of course you can do this. Because they see what you probably don't see. 
But you then trust the God who is your enabler. And you say, Lord, I receive grace and ability and I know you will walk me through. And then you dare to step up. And you take an assignment that seems bigger than you. And then you find that at every point of discomfort, there is grace and there is power. And there is unusual ability. And you'll have unusual success. Because from the beginning and the foundation of time, God knew you would get to that place. And he had made preparation for it in you. But if you allow your view and your mindset to make you give away your bread, then you will never express what you have, which is available to you. Let me run. I'm trying to... Anyway, so they spoiled the gist and said to them that they can never, they can never take the land. But Caleb, Joshua and Caleb, who were among those who had explored the land. Now I'm in chapter 14 and I'm reading verse 6. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes. They were distressed at the view and the mindset of their people. And they were disappointed. And said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land a land flowing with milk and honey and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up. How are they going to swallow them up? If the Lord is pleased with us and he has given us the land. These same giants that are bigger than us, that ordinary people are afraid of, like David facing the Goliath, could see a man speaking against his God as opposed to a giant that the whole of Israel was afraid of. Joshua and Caleb knew what the other people didn't know. That if God had given it to them, that they will swallow up the people of the land. Their protection is gone. What is removing their protection? The power and the presence of their God and the determination of God to give the Israelites the land. But the Lord is with us. Therefore, do not be afraid of them. But guess what? The whole assembly talked about stoning Joshua and Caleb. Who are your influencers? Who are those around you? Who speaks into your life and into your situation? Who contributes to your mindset? Who affects how you make decisions? Who do you listen to when you're walking towards your victory? Where do you take counsel? When you're trying to decide if you have the capacity to take on the role or not. People will tell you you're too small. You're too insignificant. You lack the power. You lack the resources. Who is your father? Who is your mother? What do you have? Who is your husband? Where have you been? Where did you go to school? You went to Ife. You went to Ilori. When there are people that went to Cambridge and went to Harvard, they forget the best of certificates in the world cannot put you on any throne except the Lord chooses to. Same place, same instruction, same location. They saw the same things. Because of those people, 
The Israelites did not get to that promised land for 40 years. Influencers, voice of fear, mindset, worldview. A land the Lord gave to them yesterday. Those things stopped them for 40 years. And God ensured that that whole generation that did not believe that they had passed away. But he kept Joshua and Caleb. If you read further by yourself, it was still Joshua and Caleb that led the Israelites into the land. The word of God as at the time of declaration is settled. That's why it still came to pass 40 years after. What is the word of God in your life? What scripture are you standing on? What promises have you been given? How do you perceive where God is taking you to? Are there battles to be fought for you to possess the land? Yes, but so what? You're a child of God. Who is battle afraid? No? To get up here, what did I have to do? I had to do what? Science students. Every step up is what? Is work. Energy exerted. Fuel burnt. And we need to burn some fuel. The way to victory has work. But who is afraid of work? The way to victory has battles. But who is afraid of battle? The battle is whose? I am victory. I am victory. I am victory. I am victory. But it's not just in the same. I don't want you to say it over the next two days. And this time and the excitement and the season will pass. And you go back home into your corner of defeat and fear and intimidation and no fruits. You have victory. You have been given. There's a scripture I want to give you as I wind down. Uh, where do I have it? Psalm 60, 12 says, with God, we will gain the victory. Not outside of our God. With our God, we will gain the victory. How many people are with God here? You're sure? You know who he is. With God, we will gain our victory. Let me tell you. You know, sometimes people ask me, why are you so fearless? I'm not. I'm God fool. You know, I have gotten to a point where I've concluded that I have nothing to lose. Why? Somebody else has the assignment to ensure that whatever I put my hands to do, I will prosper at it. And he has said it to me. That same person has said to me that nothing is impossible with him. I have nothing to lose. All I need to do is to dare to believe his word. And the only way I know if his word is true is in trying it out. So I'm not afraid to step out. And when troubles come, I face the troubles with what I know. Greater is he that is in me. You know all the scriptures. I just want you to war with it. I want you to win with it. I want you to fight with it. I want you to think of every situation in the context of your God and how he plays it out. 
I want you to look at a challenge at work and say, God brought me here because you already know that God brought you into that company and no man can take you out except the Lord is ready. And therefore, when someone says, I'm going to make, get you fired, you say, <laughs> you can't get me fired here. Why? Because the guy who put me here isn't done with me yet. And you know, you're, not, you're saying it because there's a conviction. When I'm pursuing a contract at the church center, uh, if I go for a meeting in that place, if you watch me closely, wherever the soles of my feet shall touch, the Lord has given to me for a possession. I will touch the soul of my feet and possess. And they can be going back and forth. I will keep declaring, Father, souls of my feet are touched. I possess. It's you and I together. On account of unrighteousness shall no man take my land. When people are doing magomago in a place, those are my prayers that I have coined. So because the Bible says no man will be able to stand before me all the days of my life. So I will declare all the network together cannot stand against me. They have to work for my good. Why? I will send God to the deepest corner of the meetings and declare confusion between the enemies. Surely they will gather. But the gathering is not of my God. So as many as are gathered together to take what I qualify for or that I fought for or that I believe should be mine. Ah. Now, if I do all of that and it doesn't work out, I never walk away depressed. You know why? The Bible says what? Haven't done. What do I do? Stand. So I conclude that my limited knowledge and view cannot see other things concerning that place. And the God who walks out and looks out for my interest knows that the end of that thing does not serve my purpose. And therefore, he has protected and preserved me. And I walk away to the next thing. But what I will not do is not give it my best shot with everything that I have. They that know they are God, they shall be strong and they will do express. Stand up. The battle is not your problem. The challenges are not your problem. Even if it's in your home. If you know that you married the husband that God called to you, I'm waiting for the woman that is woman enough to shift your bump. I'm waiting for the power that will speak over your children other than what you say and the word of God says concerning them. Find where you are. Find the scriptures that work for where you are, for the assignments of your life, for the issues of your life. Find it and war with it. Surround yourself with the right people. Find your encouragers, not your discouragers. Find your uplifters, not the people that bring you down. Find the place of your strength. And be smart enough to find the gaps of your life and pursue filling those gaps so you can be ready. Because what God will do, he will do. But what you should do, you must do. I have nothing else but Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's no place that I do not state it. Last week, I was in France. I was speaking at the largest European entrepreneurship conference. Massive. I shared a stage with the president of France and they had a hundred keynote speakers for the day. You come in the spotlight on the stage and you can speak about anything that you choose. And for some reason, the grace of God and the favor of God, they had called and said they built me to be in the last four, Macron being the last person. I'm a Nigerian. I was the only bloody Nigerian there. It was myself, one other lady, the global MD of Society General, and then their president. And I decided, and then you had to choose a song. A song that you like. And you give it to them. 
And when it's one minute to the end of your time, they start playing your song for the entire, it was like, I don't know how many thousands of people were there and they were streaming live across everywhere. I haven't put it on my Instagram yet. It always takes me time to get to those things. And as my essay and I wondered what song was I going to give them, I said, you know what? Tim Topper, global platform, many thousands of people. I don't give a hoot what they think. We're going to give, is it Andy Crouch? To God be the good. If there be any, I always start it wrong because I don't know how to sing. But I know how to praise my God. If there be any praise, let it go to Calvary. With your power, you have raised me. I just jumped in the middle of it because that's the part I always remember. Something, something, and then it gets to the chorus, which is, To God be the glory, to God be, whatever. So I said, eh, I said, yes, that's what they, she, they said, I can choose my song. That's my song. And that's the song I gave them. And I remember at a stage of it, I then decided, what was I going to speak about? I could speak about anything. So I said to them, I want to speak about the courage of conviction. And then I told them a bit of my story. And the battle of faith and having the audacity to stand up for what you believe. And I said to them, I'm a Christian. I have no shame about Christ. I have no shame about Christ. By our God, we have victory. I will ask you one question. And to yourself, be true. Jesus is Lord. And the power of God is real and is true. And is free.